Hello, everyone. My name is Lane Little, and I'm the director of the Polly Friedman Art Gallery at Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania, which is in Northeast Pennsylvania. I thank you for joining us for the Compulsory Measures Artist Roundtable. In this series of nine conversations, we'll talk to the artists from the show about their creative processes. This series has been made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities CARES grant called Humanities in the Time of COVID-19, Fostering Community Dialogue. In this episode, we're talking with Stephen Pearson. Stephen is professor and chair of art and art history at McDaniel College in Maryland. Stephen has four works in the exhibition Compulsive Measures, Repetition and Ritual, which is on display here at the gallery until October 18. In these drawings, which are micron on layers of Duralar, Stephen combines ghostly tracings of text and form with crisply defined geometric shapes. I will let Stephen tell you more about this practice, and I invite you to submit your comments and questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Stephen, welcome, and thank you so much for participating in this exhibition and this roundtable. Thank you. If you'll just uh, tell us about your practice, and I have some other follow-up questions as well. Okay, so I'm uh, largely a painter, um, but have actually in the past few years been focusing on drawing practice. Um, and uh, in the most recent work, I'm trying to find ways to uh, combine the painting and drawing together by cutting into old paintings and collaging them with the, the drawings and the, the styles of drawings that, uh, the drawings that are in the same style as the drawings that you see in the exhibition. Um, so for the past 10 years or so, I've been um, reinvestigating re my past paintings um, by uh, tracing sections of the paintings and um, recording moments from the past 10 years uh, of my practice um, through, through these, you know, subtle tracings of areas um, in, in my body of work and then recombining them. So I've gathered several hundred uh, stacks of uh, tracing paper with moments of my paintings. And then I sometimes randomly uh, place them together, layer them together, um, and sometimes in stacks of 10 or so, and then try to uh, just transfer this kind of cacophony of lines uh, onto uh, sheets of paper or uh, in, in the work that's in the show onto Duralar. Um, and then sometimes it's not so random. So the, the starting point might be more random, the way I layer things and just get the work down onto the, the paper or the Duralar. But then I go in and take selected, um, compos or se selected moments of compositions and uh, organize them in uh, the drawing so that they can help um, create some kind of rhythm or pattern that might make sense of all of the uh, you know, chaotic layered line that, that gets put together. So um, in, some of the, in some of the drawings, you see some repeated uh, objects like um, diving rings from you know, uh, pool toys that you throw in a, a pool and uh, go swimming after. And then uh, in the one that's actually behind you, I can see little, uh, remnants of, looks like a donut, but it's a little um, plastic toy that you would stack on a children's, uh, you know, a little toddler's toy where they stack rings to learn, I guess, organization and color. Um, so, uh, you know, just random objects that I had that I used in paintings from, uh, God, the early 2000s, I would go to garage sales and buy um, objects that fit into garbage bags and cost under a dollar and then I would use those to make um, layered still lifes. Uh, I would hang the objects from the ceiling in my studio and um, do these the still lifes of these hanging layered objects, which kind of relates to the way I work with these layered abstractions now. Um, so, so it's a it's a mix of you know uh, memory, it's a mix of chaos, and it's a mix of deliberation. Um, you know, trying to organize all the, the memories and the chaos into something that looks like it might make sense, hopefully. Thanks. Can you tell us a little, I have so many questions about, about this, but um, can you tell us a little bit how you got started as an artist? Yeah, I, um, 
Well, I've always, like, like a lot of us that get into the arts, I've always enjoyed it. You know, since I was a little kid, I remember, um, you know, drawing, uh, I think one of my earliest memories of a drawing I had was of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. And then uh, other early memories were in third grade making money by selling uh, portraits of Gene Simmons from Kiss or Donald Duck. So either you liked Kiss or you liked Donald Duck and I would sell them for a quarter. Um, so I always enjoyed making art, but I, I didn't know what I could do with it. So I, uh, uh, during high school, I didn't really think about college and uh, nobody really talked to me about college. I'm a first generation college student. So I went in the Navy um, right after high school and um, had actually thought that that would be my career until I was in for about a year and realized there's no way I, I enjoyed the time, um, you know, got, a, got the GI Bill out of it to help me go to college, but I realized I um, really wanted to pursue art and didn't want to, you know, be a, a career sailor. Um, but I, I enjoyed the experience. So after I got out of the Navy, I um, enrolled at an uh, area community college and um, that transferred to the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York. Uh, and originally I thought I, you know, when I was going to college, I thought I was going to be a teacher. I was doing the art education program until my senior year. And I uh, uh, changed my major to studio after I worked with third graders and realized it's a lot of work. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, but at the same time, also, it wasn't, it wasn't just that. I always joked that that was it. At the same time that I was teaching and doing the, the um, methods class, working with third graders, my paintings were... Um, starting to take shape they, they they felt like they were going somewhere and i felt like i was doing something that um was good and uh i wanted to keep pursuing that and i it's the first time that i thought that graduate school could be a possibility so i changed my major so i could focus on um painting more and then took a year off to um to try to build my portfolio and apply to grad school and ended up at the Grand institute of college of art in baltimore uh, where I studied under Grace Hardigan and Sam Gilliam. Um, both, you know, they came out of the abstract, uh, second generation abstract expressionist for Grace Hardigan. And um, Sam Gilliam was a uh, Washington Color School painter. Um, and at the time I was in grad school and the majority of the people in my program were all figurative painters. I was doing narrative figurative painting. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, still learned a lot from both of them about painting, about composition, about color, uh, especially Sam Gilliam, uh, color, uh, really helped my color sensibilities. Um, and then, you know, after I graduated from grad school, I, uh, didn't have the, the, mo the availability to, mo the availability of models around me as much, or maybe the money to pay them. So I started doing... Uh, so a lot of self-portraits, but then I started focusing on the, the space around me in the self-portraits, and I took the self-portrait out and started focusing on still lives. Um, and those still lives uh, got more and more complex, and you, you can actually see one behind me on the wall, this still life of um, uh, paper bags. Uh, I was, you know, these were objects I was using in my drawing classes, teaching students how to draw, starting with cardboard boxes and paper bags so they can understand measuring and perspective. And so then I was using them in my own still lives. And um, the still lives, the way I started to layer them and make them uh, dense, it started making me think of abstraction. And I was looking at, um, uh, I was actually looking at minimalist painters, even though mine got really dense, I was looking at their use of grids and uh, grid structures to organize space. Um, and uh, that then led me to uh, try, kind of step over the fence into abstraction. And I did about two years of really bad abstract paintings till they started to, uh, or it started to make more sense to me and I started to understand what I was doing with abstraction. And uh, oh my gosh. I'm not sure if it froze. Uh, no, I just turned on my mic, but I can still hear you if you okay. continue. So yeah, so then, um, uh, you know, the abstraction, you know, just kept evolving over time, uh, starting with uh, oil paint uh, in these abstract paintings and building and layering. But then 
uh, I realized, you know, the way I was layering, uh, it might, it made more sense for me to switch to acrylic um, because I could do the layering faster. Um, didn't have to use dryers that might crack the paint. Um, uh, so I switched to acrylic paint and that led to the um, current, you know, over the past 10 years or so, the current body of work of uh, playing with the acrylics and color and layering. Um, but then in 2008, I did a painting where I, I did one, I did the painting and I felt like it needed, it, it wasn't working. It felt like um, only a partial moment of a painting rather than a whole painting. So I traced it completely and did a mirror image and made a symmetrical opposite to it in uh, complementary colors. And I did that in uh, a subsequent painting and that led to the tracing of the, the paintings I was currently working on. I would uh, trace them, flip them, and uh, you know, do these uh, kind of subtle symmetry paintings. Um, and then I did a series where I was just tracing the previous, tra finishing a painting, tracing that painting in uh, 10 inch by 10 inch squares, um, and then combining and overlapping those 10 inch tracings to create a, the next composition. I would finish that, trace that, and repeat to see how much I could deconstruct or break down the painting. Um, and then that led to the paintings that I've been doing, paintings and drawings I've been doing for the past 10 years where I um, started tracing my own body of work from my um, graduate school paintings that were figurative through my still life paintings and uh, through the abstract paintings up until uh, a few years ago. I think the last set of tracings I did was uh, 2017. I've been using those tracing sets. I, I see that there's a lot of attention to form and especially when you bring up Sam Gilliam, the, the works that, that I'm reminded of are the standing sort of tent forms where he had the canvases standing on their own and I can see a little bit of that in the bags that you're really attentive to material and form. How does that translate to the Doralar material that you're using for the series that's in the gallery? Well, um, the reason I chose the Doralar is I could, um, when I was doing these, uh, transferring these trace paintings, uh, or transferring the tracings to create paintings, I would get these wonderful layers when I would overlap the tracings and transfer them to the canvas, but then the layers would get lost when I would fill them in with the paint. Um, so the material, um, you know, may transform the tracings into something more solid. So you lose the layering and you just get these newly, you know, um, uh, comprised forms where, you know, one drawing might overlap the other creates new shapes. So it transforms the memory in a different way. And I wanted to try to play with seeing the, the layering uh, more physically. So um, letting the uh, material allow the, the drawing to stay, uh, the transfer drawing to stay intact. So I um, bought some Duralar and started uh, tracing or transferring the drawings on both sides. And, uh, and then layered uh, two, two Doralar sheets. So like what you see in the show, um, there's four layers of tracings. It's front side, back side, front side, back side, so that you can see the history of the overlapping more than you can if you layered them in a painting and then you know, filled in all the, the um, juxtaposed shapes. I have a comment from my student, if you'd like to respond to it. I'll try. Uh, yeah, so um, I teach a, a class called Subjects and Symbols. Most of, actually all of my students are non-majors and this is their first exposure to any sort of art class. Um, so they do a visual analysis. They come in the gallery and they pick a work to write about. So one of my students picked What If No One Is Right, which is the one uh, over my right shoulder here. And he says that at first, Contrast and the space between shapes and lines seemed random and disorganized, but the lines that flowed through the elements gave it order and he felt like he was looking at a map. And then he concluded with, this piece is different than what the average person thinks of when they think of art. How can you respond to my students' observations, please? Um, well, I, I like the connection to the map because um, you know, they can't be thought of as you know, kind of memory maps. Um, and you know, with, with the 
the way I'm, you know, collecting the forms from my previous work, um, you know, it's the, the memory of my work, you know, the physical painting itself, but also when, you know, when I make a painting, I can't speak for every artist, I, uh, I can look at that painting and I can remember the things that were going on while I was doing that painting, what that time period was. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, books on tape while I paint and um, a lot of times I can look at the painting and remember what I listened to um, or even listen to in certain areas of the painting. So the paintings take, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, a month or more. Um, so there might be several books um, that I listen to during the process. But, uh, but it's not even just, you know, the audiobooks. It's, you know, what was going on in my life, what was going on in the news. And with the, with the paintings behind you, I was uh, also taking headlines from newspapers. Um, I'd go online, look at what's in the headlines and uh, read articles, and I would use some of those headlines. Um, and that, that's a kind of memory mapping too. Uh, putting those headlines down, I can always refer to those headlines and see where we were uh, culturally um, you know, during that time period. How has your practice evolved or changed in response to current events? Um, it, it started to, because I was, you know, focusing on the articles or the headlines, um, it was always the things that would incense me as I was, uh, you know, reading the news. And they started to feel um, more political, although, you know, I wouldn't, it's the, the I guess it's political in terms of the, the titles that I pick, the, the articles that I pick and layer in there. And, you know, made me think about that. Like, did I want them to get that political with the, um, you know, being that specific with the, the things that I was putting in there, would it um, change the meaning of the painting, you know, good or bad? Um, and so I, I've, I've been trying to think about that and thinking if I still need those in there or um, make them more subtle. Um, so it, it, it's made me think about, you know, the, I guess the, the ramifications of the choices that we put in. And I, I, I think, um, you know, as an artist, I should be conscious. I should be aware of what's going on and I should find a way to make a stand, take a stand or make my, uh, you know, things that are important to me, um, uh, to, you know, make my viewpoint uh, known at times in the work, but I also don't want it to become overly literal. Um, I think, uh, you know, when we get too literal in art, we tell the viewer what they need to think or what we're thinking, and it, there's not enough room for them to bring their own interpretations. So I'm, I'm conscious of that. And I, I mean, even throwing the headlines in there, it's, I, I think I don't run the risk of getting too literal, but I don't want the work to become uh, prescriptive, I guess. Uh, so I, I'm still wrestling with that and how to, how to um, deal with that in my work, whether it stays or whether I just uh, move away um, from that and, uh, you know, from the putting the titles in or find a different way to put them in keep them really really subtle yeah i was surprised how few of my students tried to interpret based on the title they were very focused on what they were looking at where it was on the page um very few of them really relate or really mentioned the titles at all in their essays which i was really surprised by um because sometimes they come into class because it's subjects and symbols and they expect to see a one-to-one -one correlation a circle means this, a square means this. And so having this kind of freedom with your work, I think was really um, put a lot of less pressure on some of the students who aren't used to talking about art. Okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the titles of the, the drawings themselves come from different things that are in the paintings. I think when I was talking about titles, I meant the titles of the um, headlines that I would put in the artwork, but the the titles of the artwork come from moments in the headlines, but also objects that are in the paintings. And uh, I read a book a few years ago um, uh, about um, memory and uh, ways to use um, memory palaces to 
um, remember things. So the author was, uh, the, the book was called Walking on the Moon with Einstein, I think. And uh, it was, uh, he you know, learned about memory and memory tricks and uh, entered a few memory competitions uh, uh, and did really well because he learned how to use these uh, memory palaces. And uh, the title of his book and then the titles of my paintings uh, allude to the use of those memory palaces. You, you make these absurd connections to things to remember. Uh, you, know, you might make a room in this, this mind palace or memory palace. And in that room, you're putting things you need to remember. But you have one thing in there that makes you remember those other things. Um, so uh, I, I liked the way that he used those memory palaces. and would create these odd sentences that would trigger all these uh, ways for him to remember stuff. And so that's how I started putting my uh, titles together using that same kind of absurd, you know, uh, grouping of words to make sentences. And what are you working on currently? A lot of demo drawings for my classes. <laughs> so uh, it's been hard for, you know, during the uh, pandemic with uh, two kids home, and uh, teaching online um, to, to really get into anything. I, I have worked on a couple of uh, drawings like the ones that you see you know, in the show, uh, but instead of on Duralar, they're on graphite. And I layer, I put all the layers down and then I try to um, uh, erase and highlight and find, you know, um, sense and order in them. And I try to get the same kind of layering that you see with the Duralar, just with line value with graphite. But then I've been um, cutting away sections and then piecing in actual old paintings that I had done tracings from. So these are paintings that I know I'll never show again and uh, you know would maybe be embarrassed to show again. So uh, I bet I have no problem cutting into them and collaging those shapes into the drawing. So the, the newest work I've been playing with is actually, you know, collaging still lives and figure paintings into sections of the drawings. Um, and it, but that, you know, going in, you're looking back at those figured and, figurative and still life paintings and then doing all these demo drawings for my perceptual drawing class. Um, it's really making me want to play around with uh, still lives again and uh, see how I can connect them to the abstract paintings, um, you know, making correlations and maybe it's with the way I you know, play with composition. So uh, I've been wrestling with that, like do I want to shift uh, between abstraction and uh, representation, um, you know, do some actual still lives and then actual uh, abstractions and then maybe finding a way to combine them. Uh, and, and see, you know, see what I can do with that. I'm so interested in the still life process. Is it seems like um, so when you had them suspended, were you just capturing them in as they were mobilizing themselves, or were you trying to um, capture a certain angle of them? And this is so interesting to me of the the sort of randomness of and control of it. Yeah, I was trying to I was trying to capture the the. I guess the, just the way that they would overlap and layer with each other and get these, I would set myself up so I'd get these extreme um, uh, scale shifts from foreground to background. Um, and I wouldn't work from photographs, so I had to really, you know, um, you know, stand close to some of the objects and do a lot of, use a viewfinder and do some sketches and try to figure out the, the composition and, um, but it was it was mostly looking at the the layering and the shifts the, the shifts in scale and nice. uh, to see what I could do with that. Um, and I, there were you know a couple a couple of good ones that came out of that before I just shifted into abstraction. So I'd like to play with that, see if I could play with that some more. Go back to I mean it's, it'd be going back almost twenty years. Um, I did those paintings in two thousand two and three. So. Um, it, it'd be fun to go back, but there's always that, um, you know, uh, weight hanging over your head as an artist, like, you know, thinking about shifting styles and will that, you know, 
affect you in terms of, you know, people who look at your work or, I mean, not that I really have to worry about that. I'm not represented by a gallery. And I've always avoided that because of um, sometimes the pigeonholes that you can get put into, but uh, it still feels like a big shift. But then I, I think of Gerhard uh, Richter and, uh, you know, the way he's been able to move from uh, still life portraits, abstraction, um, and make that all just part of his oeuvre. So um, I think I, I think I have to stop overthinking it and just make some paintings. Fair enough. Rennie, would you like to, as uh, our shadow panelist today is Rennie Gower, who, who um, curated the entire exhibition. Do you have anything you'd like to input? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me into the conversation. Sure. Uh, it's great to hear your history in, in a little more depth, Stephen. Um, and it's interesting to me also that of the artists that we've talked to already, we've all kind of turned to collage um, in this moment of COVID. And I was taking my dog walk this morning and I thought, man, this would be the next show that would spin out of compulsory measures, you know, the same artist, but you know, highlighting the maybe the smaller works, the more intimate works that um, we've been trying to work on in our studios, you know, with the same motivations to, you know, sort of keep up the distraction yes. <laughs> and sanity at bay. <laughs> but yes. we're reworking with materials at hand, you know, your older paintings, your older drawings, um, mm -hmm. scraps that just happen to be in the studio. And I think it would be fascinating to, um, Lane, are you interested in that? <laughs> <laughs> to that I way. mean, I'm, I'm having so much fun with all of the artists. I would love to work with any of them again. So yeah, let's, let's plan something. Okay, we'll work on that. <laughs> um, and, you know, this, this, this idea of yours having some sort of fear, I mean, this, um, or anxiety over shifting styles um, is also, I think, something that we all think about. But I don't really see it as a shift for you. It's, it's, it's like a reevaluation of something that's really ingrained in your psyche um, from, from the very roots of your practice. And um, I, I would love to see those, those, so re, those, to, those two figurative versus abstraction elements combined in your work. Uh, I think it's a great direction to think about. It's really hard to do, as you know. Yeah. Find that those two elements, but um, it's. I think it's just a fascinating um, avenue to um, sort of unpack and explore further. So I would say go for it. Yeah. Well, thanks. It's. Uh, I mean, when I, hearing myself talk about it, and then um, talking with my my wife about it recently, she's a art, contemporary art historian. Um, you know, it, it's, it comes to basically the same conclusions that you just said that there is a connection. The way I approached, you know, formal issues in the still lives um, relates to the way I approach formal issues in the abstraction. So um, it, it really shouldn't stress me out as much um, to, to go back to those, but, uh, but it's just taking that step. But, um, but you're right though, then combining them, I think right now with the way I'm collaging the old with the new, uh, the old paintings with the new abstractions, that feels like it works, but I, but then doing it physically, like if I actually made a painting that was trying to combine the abstraction and the, the still life, I think that would be harder. I, th I think there's, uh, it's really difficult to do and I've seen a lot of really bad attempts. So. Yeah, I agree with that, but maybe it's not trying to replicate the collage. Maybe it is in the physicality of the materials. Yeah, you know, that, you know the layering, which seems to be so intrinsic to the way you think, yeah. the way I think as well, and yeah. uh, just the play that's involved when you have that ability to put things together, take them apart, and put them together, you know, innumerable times until you're satisfied with whatever construct you decide is the best, and <laughs> the best arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, I would, I would love to see that. Um, I'm very curious about, and, 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 you know, Jennifer also and, and Tanya also shared with us, you know, images of some of the smaller, you know, more intimate collages that they've been pursuing as well. So I think well, it's a really beautiful little intimate exhibition. 
Well, well, it is funny that uh, so many of us have been playing with collage without realizing that each other. Well, so far, good. all of us. <laughs> you know, we'll see if it plays out with the other eight, or the other four, but. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, th I think it makes sense, though, thinking, huh. of, thinking of a lot of the artists in the show, though. Um, there are collage elements just in the way that uh, the paintings are put together. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we might have to bring that up as a, a group question for the, the round, the big round table tomorrow night. Um, yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, uh, so we're coming to the end of our time together. Uh, I want to thank Stephen for um, for talking to us and for your time and Renny also for your time today. Thanks viewers for uh, taking the time to watch this and we will be talking again to all eight artists tomorrow night, Thursday, September 24 at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, please check our website if you can or cannot attend. Um, on, you can attend live on through Eventbrite or you can check our website misericordia.edu slash art for the recordings. We're also on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And um, a downloadable catalog of all of the works in the exhibition is available for purchase at blurb.com, and we'll post that link to our website as well. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Good to see you, Stephen. Good to see you, Renny.